Good morning and welcome to this, our quarterly webinar presented to you by the Events Green Forum, this time in partnership with the South African Events Council. It's a sunny day down in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I believe we are in great company. My name is Moresi Ramunyai, and I'll be your host and your facilitator this morning. I am the deputy chairperson of this uh, event greening forum as well, and also a practitioner in the sustainability space. So right now, as we're grappling with COVID and the impact it has, a lot of governments and, and nations are moving on and rolling out vaccinations to bring this under control. What we must bear in mind and remember will not change or has not changed is our climate crisis. But added to that is this destruction to economies, to societies, and to livelihoods. But our speaker today, Professor Lorenzo Fieramonti, invites us to a different perspective. He compels us to see the situation perhaps a little differently. And what he asks us is to perhaps, instead of being obsessed with economic growth, consider a different perspective, consider well-being of societies, of nations, and of individuals. That is what we're talking about today, the well-being economy. So stay tuned, it's going to be an action-packed one hour. We will have uh, a few introductions of the parties involved, particularly the Event Green Forum and the SA Events Council. And then we'll quickly dive into listening to a professor for a 30 minute presentation, after which you are all invited to ask questions and you will get answers. So I'm really looking forward to a very engaging webinar today. I'm very excited about the topic. I think it's timely, I think it's relevant. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Ellen Ostesen to kindly introduce the South African Events Council for a brief five minutes. And then after that, we'll follow on quickly to Greg McManus, to also introduce the Event Greening Forum. They will also introduce themselves and we take it from there. Thank you very much. Welcome. Well, good morning. Yes, from a sunny South Africa. Um, as chairperson of the SA Events Council, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be on this platform this morning. Um, the SA Events Council has realized that if we are ever to resume events in a viable manner, we need to undo the damage that has been caused by the negative messaging around us being dangerous gatherings or super spreaders, which has eroded confidence in the events industry amongst government role players, our clients, and our own industry stakeholders. There's an urgent need to rebuild trust in our industry's ability to resume professionally. The events industry has always play, uh, placed safety at the top of our list of priorities and adding another COVID specific safety layer to our already comprehensive safety processes was easily achievable. Yet we are restricted to 250 persons indoors and 500 outdoors. In stark contrast to the capacities in malls, flea markets, supermarkets, and the likes, um, they can all have all these numbers, but we can't have organized business events. If we cannot do business on a viable level, there will be no event practitioners left to run events when we are able to resume fully. The Trust Us campaign is a long-term campaign, which um, positions the events industry as integral to the recovery narrative. We are reminding government, our clients and the public that we can be trusted to implement safety protocols. To add value to the economy, to deploy fully trained staff, to create jobs, to grow our clients' businesses and to offer safe, reasonable and implementable event solutions to mitigate COVID risks. We are a highly regulated professional industry, which has created back to work safety guidelines to allow us to hold events safely and viably at larger capacities. Connecting people is what we do in the events industry. Business events are one of the most important touch points through which a brand can connect 
with its clients and to build relationships. Whatever it is, whether it's a breakfast meeting, a product launch, exhibition, trade show, or conference get together, events lie at the heart of business growth. Events provide the platforms which bring buyers and uh, sellers together um, to conduct business. Business events have always contributed significantly to the economy by attracting inbound tourism, generating hospitality and tourism spend, creating thousands of temporary and permanent jobs by creating knowledge opportunities and galvanizing the sales function. Online connection simply does not allow for the same ease of connection or negotiation. We have demonstrated the capability of in-person events to be held safely, as we have done with the five proof of concepts events we've held so far. These events have been used to showcase the safety protocols in action and demonstrated the rapid antigen testing capabilities as a potential solution. We will continue to encourage both business and governmental attendants to experience our safe events. We are ready to resume. We need to be trusted to do at a more viable capacities. Please support our call by sharing our hashtag trust us hashtag and our SA Events Council on all social media platforms. I thank you for the opportunity and I wish you all well and be safe and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much for that. And uh, apologies for those who might have experienced a small glitch. Uh, Greg, can you go ahead and uh, introduce the event planning forum? Thanks, Paul Wesley. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Greg McManus. I am the chairman of the event greening forum and uh, very pleased to have you with us this morning to share in some fresh thoughts about this, everything that's gonna happen in the future. A year ago, none of us would have thought we were gonna be where we are today. Um, I think the, the, the pandemic has hit our industry a, a lot harder than we can ever imagine. And, that, and while, yes, we are going to get back on our feet and it's going to take time, we also have to accept that there is a huge market out there in terms of the corporates, in terms of individuals, in terms of uh, visitors to events and shows that are going to remain very cautious and very nervous about the future and what um, eventing is going to actually um, do to them as individuals and collectively as groups from, a, from a, a transmission point of view. But having said that, I think this is the opportunity where we can actually start looking at what it is we do from a very different perspective. And, and hopefully the professor is gonna be able to convince you as he has with us that there is something new out there. There is a new way of looking at, at our, our industry and in, in particular about how we're going to recover as individuals and as companies and businesses from this pandemic. I think there's, there's a tremendous future for all of us. Um, we, we believe that sustainability is the cornerstone of everything that we're gonna be doing into the future. And that the pandemic was just one little blip or a little warning that we need to obviously take these things a lot more seriously in the future. Prior to the pandemic, we, we were relatively loose with things like personal hygiene, personal health space, uh, social distancing and all the rest of it. But I think over the last year, we've now become very much part of this new way of thinking. And hopefully we'll be able to take this into the future, but to actually back it up with more intensive deeds, not just talking about it, but actually making a difference out there. And not only for ourselves, but also for the communities around us. Because while we may be uh, hemorrhaging like we, we've never done in the past, we need to think about everybody who depended on this industry from the local communities to the, work, the workforce to the extended business community out there that has had the impact of this very real on their tables. So 
hopefully this will give us a bit of thought where we're going from here, how we're going to position ourselves into the future. And with, with, with just keeping our heads about this and thinking clearly and following the guidelines, I honestly believe that we are looking at the opening of our industry much quicker than we would have expected. Obviously, we have to wait and see if there is a third wave. But at this point in time, all indications are that things are under control at this, at, at, at this stage. Barring the, the vaccine rollout, um, we just need to be more careful, more vigilant, and let's not give up hope because I think that is what's going to see us through at the end of the day. Some of us have been hit harder than others. There are people who have lost their businesses. They have been, they've had to lay off their entire workforce. And we now need to start saying, now, come on, guys, we can pull this together again. We can get back to where we were and we will reach those, those, those levels of business that we had pre-2019. Pre uh, so thanks very much, Mawesti. Um, I think everyone's waiting to hear from the professor and let's enjoy the rest of the morning and let's hopefully we can all walk away with something from this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And, um, and I think on that note, perhaps we must just be reminded that one of the important aspects of our existence is, is the social aspects to us. And that is precisely what the events industry um, or where the events industry actually plays a role. Because through events industry, it's not only the economic aspects to it, but it's also the human connection you know, the human, um, uh, um, uh, so the socializing and the human contact, which uh, COVID has completely um, taken quite away. So it is important that an industry as this also reflects on the well-being of the people because it's quite central and plays quite a significant role. So without further ado, I wish to introduce Professor Lorenzo Fiermonti. Professor um, Fiermonti is quite an interesting person. He's uh, actually both an active politician and an avid academic. So uh, a very interesting combination. He is actually a member of parliament in Italy, in the Italian government. He is currently there and streaming in from Italy right now. He is also the former minister of education in Italy. And uh, I hope he will tell us a little bit about some of the big pronouncements he made during his tenure, some really, really uh, game changers there in the space of sustainability. I let him do that announcement and not take away his shine. But also, he's also a full professor at the University of um, the University, the Pretoria, University of Pretoria, sorry, in South Africa, and he's a full professor on uh, political economy. So, in this case, really, uh, somebody who's uh, quite knowledgeable about South Africa and quite invested in South Africa. One of the things that uh, we've had conversations with the professor about, and he's quite passionate to um, passionate towards, and I, I wish to highlight is that, you know, he's a prime example of how academics can also become um, policymakers. You know, they're not only just contributors to bodies of knowledge and, 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 and society and social science, but they can actually drive and implement policy in meaningful and effective ways. And he has done so. He's managed to cross that bridge very well. So thank you very much for your time, Professor. We know that you're a very busy person as a parliamentarian, but also um, in your other, um, other 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 involvements and i'm really really grateful to have you here and without further ado i'd like to just hand over to yourself for the next half an hour please be engaged please judge your questions and then after this we will have a nice q a with him take it away professor thank you good morning good morning everyone and uh thank you so much for having me invited to this um, conversation i'd like to thank the event greeting forum of course and the south african events council and all the people that i've been liaising with over the past month uh, since we first made our uh, contact by email um as the title of the presentation indicates i'd like to talk a little bit about um translated into my uh, political activity and activism and um, the title is Taking the Leap into the Well-Being Economy. Um, this is, this is the, the name that I came up with, a new, a, a new vision of development, a different vision of development, and something that I developed. I'd like to highlight that while I was in South Africa. I've been spending since 20, uh, from 22 to 2018, I lived in South Africa. I did most of my studies there. I became a full professor in South Africa. I owe my academic career to this beautiful country. And only after 2018, I went on leave from the University of Pretoria, I'm still on leave, and um, to um, be appointed minister in Italy, my original, my native country. And when I was in South Africa, I started reflecting 
on what I thought was the most important question of our time, but we were not dealing with it. And that was very simply, um, you know, amid the, the full conversations about economic transformation, things that you know very well, you know, economic transformation, decolonization, and also the issues about uh, the, the, the importance of fighting inequality, reducing inequality, South Africa was a perfect case for all the different contradictions that you see in the modern economy, you know, like endemic poverty vis-a-vis -vis incredible amounts of wealth, uh, beautiful natural ecosystems, but also an increasing level of pollution. Um, still um, a, a very different economies nested within each other and a lot of issues around uh, personal stress, um, personal issues, personal, you know, abuse of pharmaceuticals and medicines and family issues and all of that. So it was this incredible contradiction between, if you will, what we mean by development and what we understand as underdevelopment. So within that context, I started asking myself, but what is really economic development for? What is really economic growth? Um, everyone is obsessed with economic growth, but what do we really mean by economic growth? Where do you see economic growth? When is that a country is doing well? And I basically, as an economic historian, as a political scientist and a professor of political economy, I started using my knowledge and doing a lot of research into the origins of all of this. And I basically came to the conclusion that we were fundamentally confused around the world, that we initially embarked on this journey we call development to increase human well-being. But then we forgot that that was the end and we took the means the accumulation of products, the accumulation of consumption as the end in itself. And this is absolutely wrong. Um, and this is why we see so many contradictions around the world, but also in South Africa. Um, you know, we see traffic jams as an indication of developed society, but those are not necessarily desirable things. We see increasing insecurity as an indication of, the, of, the, of a developed society. You know, South Africa, in South Africa, the security industry is probably the number one contributor to employment in the country, but certainly not an indication of a successful economy, because it is unfortunately true that the more people feel insecure, the more the economy moves because we buy gates, we hire security guards, we buy guns, and we uh, you know, have to protect ourselves against threats. Paradoxically, I found out incredible things like the more you protect yourself against pollution, uh, the more the economic growth uh, dial ticks because you need to buy bottled water because tap water is contaminated. So you buy more things and more, more waste is produced and then the waste needs to be cleaned up and you activate a circle of expenses that are what we call uh, protective expenses, not desirable expenses. So this was really, really crazy. I know. So I said, okay, someone has to come up with a different idea here. So can we develop an economy that reduces the negatives and increases the positives? And I call that a well-being economy. And what does medical and social research tell us about um, um, personal well-being? Our well-being as humans, like you as you were indicating, our well-being as humans is basically the by-effect of two main things, the, our personal health and the health of the environment. We cannot grow healthy in um, a, an unhealthy society. We cannot grow healthy in an unhealthy environment. Um, so this is as simple as this, right? This is so, so uh, uh, you know, in a sense, so banal. But it's pretty revolutionary because when you look at what we have done over the past decades, we have done exactly the opposite. And the pandemic is the final proof of this. For so long, we have simply disregarded health as an economic driver. We have considered health as something that you can do without, you know, like often, often posing the question, you know, like sacrifice a bit of health for more income. You know, well, we need to accept a bit of more contamination and pollution because you're generating jobs, health, at the end of the day, can be sacrificed. Exactly the same as we did with the environment. Incidentally, I don't know how many of you know that in South Africa, you find the most polluted air in the world. Often we think of pollution, air pollution, and we think of China and India and these uh, people wearing masks, by the way. They started wearing masks long before we started doing it because of COVID. But actually, the most polluted air in the country is in, in Pumalanga, in, in the former uh, city of Whitbang, now known as Malaleni, right? So um, 
that is in the coal belt. That's where you find the most incredibly polluted air in the whole world. And, and, and it's, in, it's striking that this is happening in a country where you still have uh, pristine reserves next to it. And at the same time, such a level of poverty and inequality, because you would expect that to be the by effect of an extremely industrialized society. But nowadays it's becoming, it's happening that also countries that haven't yet fully industrialized are already experiencing all the negative consequences of this. So the contradictions were immense. As I said, you know, insecurity can be fueling a lot of economic growth and we should try and reduce that. So I put together this, this concept. I wrote a book in 2017, which was first published in South Africa and then published also across the rest of the world, uh, which was titled The Wellbeing Economy. How can we develop by reducing all the negatives and increasing all the positives? And that is a possible, we can now do that. We can do that very effectively. And how do we do that? We do that by changing a little bit the rules of the economic game by, for instance, indicating very clearly that when companies pollute, they have to take the costs of pollution into their own balance sheets. We need to make sure that companies do not have an incentive to pollute as it is at present, but actually they are, in a, in a sense, partly sanctioned and punished so that we steer them towards better production. We need to produce not more things, but better things. So unfortunately, our idea of economic growth in the, you know, seems to suggest that the more we produce, regardless of what, the better we are. And that is scientifically not true. We need to produce better, not more. You know, the existence of waste is an indication that something doesn't work in, in, in the economic machine. Because waste, if the economy worked well, waste wouldn't be produced because people would get what they need. And that resource, which is what is left out, should never be disposed of, but should be reused in order to produce um, in a circular economy approach what comes next. We need to take health very seriously. And this is, this is you know, let me give you an example. Uh, for so long, we have considered that working more means you know, working better, being more productive. While scientifically, this is absolutely not true. Often it is the opposite. We, when we work, we have a bell-shaped curve. At the beginning, we're very, quite not so productive. After a few hours, we become very productive. But after five or six hours, our level of productivity starts going down because we're human beings. We're, you know, we have our own productivity um, systems to take into account. So we have realized that when you work better and you work less, you actually become more productive than when you work poorly and you work for a long period of time. We've also realized in the Wyoming economy approach that when people get more free time to spend with their families, this has a fundamentally powerful and positive impact on the economy and on society. Unfortunately, for instance, in South Africa, but this is true across the world, but I think South Africa is a case in point, we have forced a lot of people to work very long times, far from homes, and this has generated a very negative impact on their own families, on the upbringing of their children, but as a consequence on society, because we have seen spikes in, criminal, in, in, in crime, we have seen that the lack of parenting for many children has become a significant propensity to become, to get more involved in criminal activities and become a cost to, to society and so on and so forth. So somehow that idea that by making people work more was gonna be good for the economy was exactly the opposite. We should have done it differently. We should have said, no, hold on a minute. I want you to work a given amount of time, work as well as you can, but I also want you to be able to look after your children, to be a parent, because your parental activity is a fundamental driver of well-being, and well-being has a positive impact on the economy for everyone. Just like exactly the same, um, what I've mentioned about the, the uh, personal well-being and personal health has a, a consequence for work-life balance. This is something, again, we have forgotten. And even now, even now, we're still thinking that you know, extending working hours, increasing working hours, in some cases will make us more productive when uh, scientific indication is exactly the opposite. Um, so and not taking seriously personal health as generated the COVID pandemic and other pandemics before COVID, we should never forget where this pandemic is coming from. This pandemic doesn't, it's not God given, it doesn't come from Mars. This pandemic comes from 
interference with ecosystems, deforestation, the destruction of the natural environment, and the more this has been true across history, every time we as humans, or any animal for that matter, encounters a virus or a bacteria that has been isolated from us for millions of years, we get sick. Okay, this has been the case all, always. The more we devastate the environment, the more we build homes and industries in pristine environments that hadn't been touched by humans for millions of years, the more we're going to bump into viruses that will kill us. So when we don't understand that, it's like we're operating like two-year-olds that think they've got it right. They think they've known everything. And then they get punished and then you know they have to sit and learn again. But in this process of learning, millions of people die. We destroy something that may not be regenerated again. And we have all these, you know, this ramification of negative consequences across the world. So as Greg McManus was saying, I really hope that this pandemic is not just the most terrible um, experience our generation had to go through. And it's not just uh, the most incredibly disastrous economic crisis we have seen since the Second World War, but it's also a learning opportunity. Because if we don't learn from this, then we don't deserve to, to overcome the crisis. I think it's been it built into our way of being as humans that we make a lot of mistakes, but geez, at least we learn and we should try and learn as effectively as possible from this and put well-being really at the core. So when it comes to personal, to personal health, for instance, and Moesi was mentioning this, the quality of our social connections is extremely important, not just for ourselves, but for the economy. The economy cannot work properly unless we trust one another, unless we are friendly with one another. We as social animals thrive because of these connections. Isolation doesn't do well to us as human beings, doesn't do well to the economy in which we're operating. This is why when we see inequalities increasing, that is a problem not just for society, but also for the economy, because more inequality is also associated with less social trust. And we see that happening in countries like South Africa, but also in the United States. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, we spend more and more money to protect ourselves against each other. We don't trust one another, you know, and when that happens, the economy starts slowing down because, you know, you can't check each and every contract. If you do not trust your neighbor or someone that can come and work for you, you're never going to um, have a very dynamic economy. So not having considered social connections and social cohesion as something that needs to be preserved not only for the beauty of life and, and of social connections, but also for economic advancement has been an incredibly, uh, an incredible mistake on the side of economists and policymakers. Um, social connections impact our well-being and ecosystems, as I said, impact our well-being. Our new model of economic growth, if centered on well-being, should really put how well we structure social cohesion and how we promote and protect the environment as the cornerstones of a new model of development. Companies should be rewarded for becoming greener, not being, you know, not often our legislation. That's why I became a politician because I realized that unless our legislation changed and started giving incentives for companies and for people to produce well and to consume well and to avoid overconsumption and avoid overproduction. And like you do for the event industry, I'm referring to the forum, trying to tell everyone that each industry can make a significant contribution to greening uh, society by using the right products, by helping the companies that produce those products rather than those that produce the old products, the very contaminating and polluting products, and realizing that all our economic activities have a footprint. And if we can reduce that footprint, we do well not just for the environment, to the environment, what we do, the, we do well to ourselves as a company um, itself. This is so. This is why, after having done all of this, um, coming from South Africa, I took the opportunity of getting involved into policymaking, because I fundamentally believe that uh, every sector has to play a role. Culturally, we need to be very prompt at asking the right questions, not take anything for granted, not believe that the usual concept of economic growth as the maximization of production and consumption, regardless of the consequences, is right. As industry, always ask ourselves whether we're doing the best, whether we are really contributing to societal well-being, not just to our own profit. As I said, only thinking in terms of immediate profit 
is often short-sighted for the sustainability of the company itself. Because then when you get into this, into crisis, everyone pays the consequences and your company is, as well. When we hit the water crisis, remember in South Africa, after having over-consumed water for so long and thinking it was infinite and endless, how many companies suffered from lack of water? The South African breweries, for, to give you an example, was up in arms because they thought their own business model wasn't going to be sustainable anymore. So all of a sudden, many of them said, my God, we didn't take water so seriously. And now even our own production lines are stalling. How many people that had bought their homes in Clifton, Kim's Bay and Cape Town started uh, really uh, um, fearing the consequences in terms of not only their life, but also the value of their capital, the value of their estate. Again, if we don't take the environment seriously. In Miami, Florida, many houses, many homes, many states are worth much less than a few years ago because the insurance companies are no longer paying uh, for you know, covering insurance. In many parts of Australia, insurance companies are no longer insuring ha houses that are too close to woods that are prone to wildfires. And this triggers an effect on the banking industry. It doesn't give you a mortgage if you don't have insurance. And all of a sudden you think your millionaire house was going to be the best um, purchase of your life, the best investment of your life. And all of a sudden you realize it's worth probably nothing. So this has a cascade impact on all we do at the economic level. So putting well-being at the center is crucial. And as a policymaker, we need to, as policymakers, we need to encourage companies by changing the norms. Nowadays, for instance, there's no incentive for people that produce better to do so and have a fiscal incentive, have a fiscal gain out of this. Often those that pollute actually get rewarded because they are not, certainly not given any disincentive to do so. And at the same time, we don't even recognize the fact that their production is ineffective and has a negative impact. So many business people, unless the rules change, keep telling me, look, I do what has always been done because if you don't change the rules, things will not, you know, I'm not gonna have an, an, an incentive to do so. And even if I change myself, I'll be probably replaced as a manager or CEO of a company and they will hire someone else that continues doing what has been done in the past. So. I decided to get involved into, in, in politics and I became a minister of education, um, starting with the conviction that at the basis of all of this, we do need a cultural revolution. We do need a, a new education model because think about it. When we send our kids to school, what do we teach them? We teach them to be competitive. We often teach them to make money. We teach them that the role models are not always though those companies those CEOs, those civil society activists, those politicians that do well, but those that make a lot of money. And not always are the two things the same. It depends on how you make the money. A lot of people that make a lot of money make a lot of money at the expense of societal well-being. But we groom and raise our children looking up to these people. And then when we send them to universities, what happens? We teach them, if you go to a business school or if you study economics, that you don't have to care about the environment, that you don't have to care about society. Your job is to maximize profits. Your job is to be more competitive than others. Your job is not to collaborate with your colleagues, but to compete with them because you need to be faster than they are. If we keep on doing this, we're never going to get out of this contradiction of this paradox. We're never going to we're never going to solve these problems. So that's why I thought education was a fundamental issue to tackle. And as a minister, I started changing how universities work, for instance. And I said to them, I want students of economics to study about the ecology, to study about biology as well. So they have to major in economics, but I want them to have an exposure to what that means for the climate to what it means for society, what it means for social cohesion and so on and so forth. I said, I want engineers not only to be great builders, but also to be understanding how the ecosystems work because they're gonna have to build bridges and buildings that will have an impact on the environment. And if, we do not, if they ignore what happens when you interact with the environment, they're not gonna be good engineers going forward. And the same applies to a number of other fields. So I have made it mandatory for universities in my country to have a first year in all disciplines where students have to teach, uh, sorry, have to learn a lot of different subjects 
that will have an impact on how intelligent and sustainable their approach will be in whatever discipline they decide to, they decide to, spe to specialize on. And I think this is extremely, extremely important in South Africa as well. But even more so, I thought you can't really act only at the level of universities because by the time kids are 18 or 19 years old, somehow they've become adults and their brain has already been shaped. And if they have internalized a certain way of seeing the world, they will probably apply it regardless. So I made it, I decided to include in school curricula from grade one to grade 12, mandatory across the board, learning about our interaction with the climate. So we called it uh, education for sustainable citizenship. Not something, I don't, I, you know, I didn't expect kids to study how the climate works and the water cycle. It's not about a scientific approach. It's about learning what you can do to be a better climate aware, environmental aware citizen. So we merged the um, conventional module of the civics, of civic education with climate awareness together. So as of 2020, students in Italy from first grade do projects and study and learn what they can do in their own community to take care of the environment and to take care of their communities and to be more active players in this process. They develop projects with their schools. They turn their schools in micro energy universes. So they help uh, the school um, build um, veggie gardens and, and uh, uh, install uh, new energy systems like uh, PV panels and, and solar panels and so on and so forth. So they are, they're basically together with experts and together with their teachers turning schools into microcosms of a well-being economy. And that has an incredible impact on society across the board. We have studied now with a, an international team that was started by the Italian experience. What is the impact of greening schools and greening education in terms of reduced carbon footprint? around the world. You'll be surprised to hear that if we were to do this across the world in all schools, or we would have a better impact on climate change reduction than by installing PV panels and wind turbines and all of that across the world. You know why? Because children are powerful game changers because when they learn something, they go back home and they teach their parents and they start in you know uh, having an impact on the consumer attitude of millions and millions of families they're there to remind mom and dad hey why don't we do it this way rather than the usual way why don't we avoid plastic and buy something this way you know so they become ambassadors of a new way of thinking that has an immediate impact on consumer behavior across the world and this has been estimated to be much more significant immediately than the impact that you may have by installing all the right technologies which actually take years before they come to um to full uh to full power so this is why and i'm concluding this whole idea of a well-being economy based on a well-being culture revolution is spreading so fast out of South Africa, where it was initially um, envisioned, to countries like New Zealand, where it's become an official policy now. New Zealand has put the well-being economy as its official economic policy. Countries like Scotland, Iceland, uh, Wales, Finland have now created a well-being economy alliance to make sure that this new way of thinking replaces the conventional economic growth and you know production and consumption paradigm. It's spreading to Italy in the field of education. And the new administration, yes, administration of Pre President Biden, just a few uh, months ago, called me and others to become advisor to their team, their education team, because they want to do exactly what Italy did. They want to do it in the US. And if you're interested to know more, in a week's time, next Thursday, the 22nd of April, which is Earth Day, I'll be on a panel with representatives from the US administration uh, for um, the um, ongoing activities that have to do with Earth Day and discussing exactly these issues with uh, the Biden administration. The title will be quite telling. How can we get the American administration to do what Italy did? 
And I think this is quite encouraging that now even a country which has been culturally so resistant to change because America is the land of consumption. America is the land of biggest beautiful. And, but now it's embracing a new, starting to embrace a new vision. The pandemic somehow has played a role and they've started to realize that you cannot be a developed country if you have so many people that still live in, in conditions of limited literacy. You know, America is paradoxically one of the countries with the lowest level of literacy in the industrialized nations. It has a life expectancy, which is less than many underdeveloped countries. And it has a level of obesity and child-related diseases, which is out of control. So somehow they're realizing that their economic model, which we had thought was the best in the world, is actually wrong. And it's having a terrible impact on the whole world, but also on themselves. And I think this is, this is quite encouraging and it really encouraged everyone across the world and in South Africa, especially to, to realize that going forward, we can develop differently. We can do better. We don't have to replicate old models. Being developed doesn't mean to do what others have done before you because others have done a lot of bad things. As I used to say to my students when I was uh, teaching in South Africa, if Africa thinks of developing like Europe did, it will have to include also the necessity to colonize half of the world, to get involved into a number of wars that killed millions of people, to be the cause of the First World War, to be the cause of the Second World War, to probably colonize China and India because it will need so much expansion and an empire to take resources away from these countries. Guess what? I don't think Africa will ever be able to do it. Even, the, even if that was desirable, and I don't think it is, I don't think Africa will ever be able to do so. So it can only develop and going forward if it embraces a different way, if it does it better than others and somehow can teach everyone else that this is our way. We take things seriously. We take personal health and the health of our ecosystems so seriously that we turn it into a driver of development. We turn it into something that can really have a fundamental and significant impact on job creation, on widespread uh, prosperity, and so on and so forth. And again, we have proven beyond any reasonable doubt that this can be done, that all these activities, when you start changing the perspective, become profitable. And at the same time, that profit is not just for your company, but it's for society as well. It's a win-win. I make more money, maybe not as much money as I could have made if I were following the conventional path, but I make more money. And by creating less damage, I actually become rich in myself as well. Because, because at the end of the day, I live in a better society in which everyone is better off. And the profit I make is quality profit, not profit that then I need to use to take care of all the negatives that I have generated in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that really, really, really was just so engaging. I can't believe we're already at the end of a 30 minute presentation. My favorite takeaway so far, I've got a lot, is uh, change the rules of the economy. And um, I like that professor because you are throwing us straight into um, action. It's a, call, it's a call for action actually. Um, and it can be done. You've given us practical examples. And uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, everyone in our audience will agree that that was uh, quite a, um, a compelling uh, presentation. I have a few questions for you. And uh, Professor, you can also look in the Q&A section. Um, um, I will just read them from the top and we'll just take them one at a time. So Simon, um, says that he's been working to enable the well-being economy in his Maker's Valley, um, and that is in Johannesburg, the CBD, and that people often confuse well-being with wellness and uh, physical health. And what he wants to know from you, Professor, is uh, that you mentioned um, health um, as one of the aspects, but what about all the other contributors to a well-being? because it seems there's a deep sense of happiness and life satisfaction, things like that, for example, social relations um, and so forth. So, so, so more than an outside of health, what are the other key contributors? Um, if you can just uh, repeat those for us, please. Uh, thank you, Simon. I think your question is extremely um, pertinent. Um, first of all, well-being is not, is not wellness. This is to be clarified immediately. Although wellness, of course, has an impact on well-being, but well-being is way, way wider, way much broader than that. Why do I say so? Because we see that a lot of people are taking care of wellness and some companies are saying, yeah, I want my, my 
employees to be to be uh, healthy, but not because I want them to change the way they live and live better and live more satisfied, but because they need to work more. So, which is okay. It's, well, it's, I'm not contesting that. I think you know taking care of your employees' wellness or your citizens' wellness is important, but it shouldn't be seen as a way of producing and consuming more. It should be seen as a way of producing and consuming better. And, and so this is, this is fundamental. Um, Simon is perfectly right. Happiness, life satisfaction are, are extremely uh, important, but it's not for me or for any theorist to decide what happiness is, right? So I'd like to, to emphasize this. So while I consider that fundamental, and I think that if you live scientifically, I think there is a lot of evidence that if you live in, an, in you have good health, you have good social connections, and you live in a healthy environment, then you are going to be happier as well. Uh, but you can be happy in many different ways. Okay, it's not for me or for the state or for society to tell you how to be happy. Uh, while it is for me and for society to tell you, look, how you can protect the environment, how you can make sure you don't get sick, how you can make sure that you raise your children, you have more time to raise your children, because I believe that raising your family is a fundamental positive contribution to society and to the economy, and it's not taking, it's not time taken away from, from working, right? So Simon knows my work, I, I know Simon, and he knows my work, and he knows that Although personally, I think happiness is extremely important as an effect. I think that as an economic model, you need to take, leave it out of the model. And you need to say, here, I'm working on all those conditions that will make your life better. Then it's up to you to be happy. And perhaps because there are other contributors to your happiness that have to do with your character, with your aspirations, with your personal, um, you know, with your personal ambitions and so on and so forth. And I, I can't, I can't control that, but I can give you all the basic requirements for you to then thrive. And, and also there is, there is an element of psychological development and psychological conditions that have to do with happiness that if you include into the job of the state, I think you are probably trespassing somehow. Um, so, um, so all these, as I said, all these things are fundamentally important. I've mentioned personal health, personal connections. We cannot just be healthy and in isolation. We need to have healthy connections with others and ecosystems as the main drivers. That's why I call the well-being economy based on two, two types of health, social health and ecological health. These are the two drivers. Within this, you find both the personal and the collective health, as well as the health of our ecosystems. And these are the drivers of a new way of, uh, of, of um, organizing the economy. Great, and then, and then Gavin uh, would like to know, Professor, is how do we balance the opportunity cost of our health against the business events industry, so quite specific to our industry, and which you know, still has a long way to go to, to recovery. When we do this, what should the priorities be? Well, I think the priority, first of all, it's very much in line with what you have indicated to make people understand that because we cannot thrive in isolation, the events industry is a fundamental driver of development in any country. Now, I want, I don't know you personally, but I assume, you know, knowing how it goes in many countries, that politicians don't see the event industry as the number one assets for the economy in South Africa, right? They talk about mining, they talk about, um, you know, more conventional, probably security and so on and so forth. I think this is fundamentally wrong. How is this fundamentally wrong? I want to be very outspoken with you to continue thinking that mining, the way it's been happening over the past century, is still an asset for the country. I think mining has damaged South Africa so terribly that it's, it's, it's really disappointing to see politicians considering that still as one of the main assets of the economy. And the same applies to many other sectors, that when you do the full accounting, you realize that many of these sectors have generated more problems and damage than profits. So how can you consider a sector to be valuable if it does more if it actually has a negative more of a negative impact than a positive impact? What is the problem? is that we never measured the negative impact. That's why we came to the conclusion that mining and other industries are good for the economy. They are not. Still, they either change completely or they may become what brings the economy down. And you can see that in Mozambique. Look, because of gas, they now have a new civil war. 
they had come out of the civil war, but now a new fossil resource, which is supposed to be under the ground for a reason, has been taken out and now Mozambique is going down the drain again. So every time, and this is happening across the board. So when we realize this, we all, all immediately realize that other sectors that are more, that have got to do more with the human economy, with encountering innovation, supporting exchanges, are the real wealth of a nation. If we were to consider what is the wealth of a nation nowadays, you know, if, if Adam Smith was living, you know, the famous Scottish philosopher and economist who wrote the wealth of nations in the 18th, in the 18th century, if he was going to write it now, he would say the real wealth of a nation are its people, the quality of its people. If we can educate our people to be better, if we can allow them to exchange ideas and innovate more like you do every time you organize a conference and exchange, that's precisely what drives economic success. So by doing, by, you know, launching this message, I think you're going to do very well to your sector. And now with COVID, we risk undermining precisely those sectors that have the most positive impact on economic success. And, and this is extremely, extremely dangerous. So I think this new narrative should be the, the priority and government should realize that protecting the social economy is protecting the future of the country. Mm. So Professor, whilst we're on um, measuring damage, Helen also asked the question, you know, around, um, should there not be a policy around say company, um, green company audit? Um, of sorts where, where we can indicate levels of waste or environmental damage and I guess in, in, in other ways hold them accountable financially too. Um, totally. What are your thoughts there? Absolutely, Elena, I agree with you completely. So much so that I propose that in my books and I've also proposed it in government. And um, if you Google what I've done, you know, you will see that I've been, you know, the first proposer uh, proponent in, in Italy of a new reform, fiscal reform, that was going to lower taxes for those that produce in a green fashion, lower them tremendously, so that companies have an incentive to do the right thing, and increase taxes on those that produce according to the old principles and don't take care of the environment and or society in their impacts. Nowadays, we simply rely on CSR. We hope that companies will do the right thing because of consumer demand, because consumers are changing their attitudes. We don't have time for that. It takes too long. We need to have rules that say, if you pollute, you pay. And if you do not pollute, I help you because I lower your taxes so that you can be more competitive. Nowadays, in many countries, we don't have that. So yes, green company audit and doing total cost, what we call total cost accounting not just in your balance sheet, what you do and how much money you make, but also, but actually the total cost accounting, what are the negative impacts on society, on your workforce, on, on, on the planet and so on and so forth. And you will see that a lot of companies that are making billions these days will have a hard time stay competitive and they will be uh, expected to change quickly. I really like that total cost accounting, you know, uh, not just the financial cost, but all the other costs to our society as well. That's fantastic. A, a short one from Nicholas. And I think he's asking, um, he says any interest from China? And I'm assuming that's in relation or similar to what the US have asked of you. What Look, is it I, yeah, I was, I was in China in 20, uh, last time I was in China before the pandemic was at the end of 2019. And I presented similar um, topics to the Chinese government. And the Chinese government is aware of this. But China is still a country that has to go through a, 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 I would say, a collective realization because they still think they're rich, uh, although there is an incredibly high level of inequality in China, but they think they're rich. And so it's hard to tell someone, look, this may be, your wealth may be uh, you know, visible now, but it's apparent. Just to give an example, in China, no one drinks water from the tap. You only drink water from bottles, right? So you don't expect a country that is success economically successful to not be able to drink water anymore. I think this is, a, this is a sign that something is wrong. So this is the first message that when I was there, I was like, if you think you're rich, take care of your water. It cannot exist a country that believes to have made it and doesn't have running drinking water in, at homes, in hotels. And, and the same applies to many other sectors. You know, the Chinese started wearing those masks long before we did. And often they did it not because of diseases, but because of pollution. And it's sad to live like this. It is sad for them. And now they're realizing it. 
So many of them are coming back even to me and saying, look, can we get a sense of how we do it? Because we need to learn as quickly as possible because we have probably taken it too far. So there is a lot of interest from China too, especially from cities. That's, that's fantastic. So um, if I can just take the liberty myself, uh, Prof, one of the things that I've observed and has bothered me for a long time is that you see a lot of migration in South Africa specifically, a lot of migration from the rural areas into the cities, for example, and uh, people come into the city to do uh, sometimes uh, not very well-paying work, obviously at the cost and expense of their health. But um, the main reason people, or, or rather the, the main um, use of the money that they earn is food, you know. And uh, similarly, I've observed in a lot of your rural areas, people have neglected uh, doing any agricultural work and would rather look and seek for work to buy food, you know. And, and I've always been bewildered by <laughs> and puzzled by this, this, this triangle that for me does not make sense, that you work to purchase food, but you could actually produce food and maybe not need to work and stress yourself in the process and incur the additional costs that come with actually looking for a financial income. And if food is, is really what you do at the end of the day, or what is your main cost, uh, surely then producing food and, and doing some agricultural you know, uh, work inside you know, a community or inside the home uh, can be a consideration. Now, what are your thoughts about that? Um, you're perfectly right. But I also think there is a, a, a bigger problem there. Uh, this is a lot to do with this, how the South African economy is structured. The South African economy uh, incentivizes big, big industries, big distribution, the supermarkets, shopping malls, and has completely destroyed uh, local economies in most cases. Uh, many of them are informal to the point of not being, of being subsistence or completely not viable. And this is a great mistake from an economic point of view. If you look at a country like Italy, for instance, Italy has thrived over centuries thanks to small, medium, and micro enterprises. So, uh, it's very easy for, for an Italian to find artisans, to find carpenters, to find uh, plumbers, and so on and so forth. This is extremely hard to find these days in South Africa. It's really hard for someone who was an informal, small, you know, like say, entrepreneur to be able to get started if you're not coming from a relatively well-off or developed part of the country. So that's why when you go to many rural areas or many, si many sites of the big cities, you see this incredible, uh, there is a, certainly a supermarket at carpenters. You don't see um, artisans, you don't see the local economy. So A, it's very hard to earn an income, a good income, when you are a small entrepreneur in South Africa. And this means that 50, 60% of the people are out of the economic system. B, um, biggest beautiful means that uh, the proliferation of shopping malls has completely or almost entirely destroyed uh, the, the, the small shops, the family shops, the family owned shops. Um, I remember telling my students whether they had ever seen a butcher and they would say, yes, a pick and pay, there's a lady selling meat. Well, that's not a butcher. That's an employee of a supermarket. A butcher is a person that runs his own business where you go and buy your own meat. And of course, you find some of them in, in, um, in some districts in Johannesburg and Cape Town. But that's where people like me go to buy some, um, you know, like gourmet meat and so on and so forth. When I talk about a butcher, I mean people that do this thousands of times across the entire national territory. And the same applies. So we do need a strategy to A, allow and support small entrepreneurs, artisans across the spectrum in South Africa. That's the only way in which you can generate good income at the local level. You spoke about food. And the same applies, of course, to farmers and so on and so forth. Not only is it food, but it's what kind of food? I mean, it's so evident that a lot of people, especially the poorest people, spend a lot of, most of almost their money to buy food, which is understandable, but to buy junk food junk food enriching supermarkets, crappy foods, excuse my French. Um, you know, I, I, I have my writing joke with many South African, many of my South African friends that bread and Coke are, have become the, the bread and butter, you know, like the, 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 the common um, intake of food for many South Africans. That is opening a big gate to um, endemic obesity, like you find in Mexico, many other countries. And it's not 
by by chance that um, um, South Africa has the highest level of uh, obesity, uh, the highest body mass index in Africa, and a lot of cardiovascular disease is now affecting people that are poor, not just people that are wealthy. So obesity is becoming a problem also for relatively disadvantaged communities, not just for those that have too much. You have a lot of interest, um, interested um, <laughs> participants, Professor, and uh, for that reason, I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm going to encroach a little bit, about five minutes or more of your time, and that will just lead us to conclusion. But a question from Zintle, and she's asking, well, first she says, brilliant discussion, Prof, and she's interested in understanding how the well-being economy can interlock with shared value. You know, shared value um, is not corporate social responsibility and philanthropy. Uh, creating shared value is that at the core of the business strategy, you know, are there any linkages between the two narratives? And I think if I may add to that, I, I, I wanted to find out as well for myself, where do we see the well-being economy being driven inside the organization? Do you see it at a strategic level of the organization or a little bit further down below in a human resources department or a well-being champion, for example, wellness, you know, that's where you might end up seeing it. Please answer that for us. Yes, simply. Thank you so much for the question. I come from a shared value experience, right? I come from having worked with uh, small companies, uh, with some corporations, very visionary corporations, and from and and NGOs. So from that philanthropy set, uh, well, sorry, the, the the sort of structural transformation of how the core business of companies operates. I come from there. Yes. I think that is a step in the right direction, but it's not a new framework and it's not a policy framework. So the well-being economy is a policy framework. It's not just a, um, something that a visionary CEO does. Um, so shared value, absolutely important. It is basically the preamble of the well-being economy. It's the starting point. It needs to be total. It needs to be at 360 degrees. It's not that common to find shared value that really takes seriously every, all the dimensions that I've mentioned into account, okay? Uh, often they just um, they, often it's restricted to the workforce. So how well you treat your workers, not uh, 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 in some cases it extends to community, but not always does it really have an impact on the entire business approach. The well-being economy is taking that to the level of macroeconomy, if you will, to macroeconomic policy. So it's to tell governments and states, we need to change the rules of the game. We need to change what we mean by economic growth. If we do not change what we mean by economic growth, we'll have this continuous contradiction that companies try to improve, but then when you measure their impact on GDP, they're gonna have the opposite incentive because your, our GDP is wrong, because how we measure growth through GDP is wrong, because GDP doesn't take into account any of the other things I've mentioned. It only takes into account how much money you make. It doesn't care if that money is made at the expense of society and of nature and of people. And so for as long as we have this contradiction between, sorry, between what a company should do and what the economy as an entirety, as a whole, expects of companies will have this continuous back and forth. Some CEOs push more in the right direction and they get replaced by CEOs that go in the opposite direction. But if we align the vision of shared value at the micro level of a company with the new vision of, if you will, of well-being economy at the macro level of the entire economy, then it's gonna be much easier for everyone to say, I go full on board down this new, down this new route. Thank you very much. And I think just one last question. Um, I'm going to request that uh, Prof, uh, between us, we answer the rest of the questions um, online and uh, at least uh, address that. But just one last question from Lorraine, um, who's quite impressed with what you've done and saying that adding these subjects to university curricula is um, really the most brilliant and realistic solution she's heard in a very long time. So bravo, Lorenzo. And uh, <laughs> she wants to know, are they compulsory or voluntary? And also, are they tested? Okay, so as I said, uh, we made it compulsory for all schools. So from grade one to grade 12, it's compulsory. And you also get a mark. This is this is something, you know, because if you make it compulsory, but students are not are not rated on it, uh, are not graded on it, then it may be secondary. Now, students are quite happy to say, mom, I got the best mark. You know, I got an A plus or whatever in, in education for sustainable uh, citizenship, right? So it's something that they're becoming more and more proud of. Um, this new system for schools is mandatory. We started in 2020. So you can imagine that the testing process is still not happened because of the, of the COVID pandemic, because basically this came into force the year when schools were mostly closed. So a lot of it had to start very slowly. 
So, but we're going to do testing as of next year. At the university level, unfortunately, it's not yet mandatory, but um, so it's voluntary for universities to create these um, initial uh, cross-cutting uh, subjects. But I can tell you that out of 95 universities we have in Italy, over 70 have already adopted it. So it's not mandatory, but I think universities have come fully on board with the need to do so. And the point is not just to have a first year in which you get contaminated with other, other inputs. The point is that slowly but surely, these new subjects will positively transform our curricula. That's the point. That's the point of not having just one subject, once, you know, one hour a week in which you do something different. It's to be able to transform also the, 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 main, the, main, the main topics, how we structure our curricula in schools and universities. And I think that is the medium to long-term objective. What I see already is the incredible positive, incredibly positive impact that this is already having on people's attitudes and behaviors. When they tell you education only changes things in the long term, Tell them now. It's not true. Education has a transformative power in the long term, but also has an immediate impact on people's beliefs and behaviors today. Fantastic. So, uh, Prof, really, um, Nicholas King has quite a few very important questions. Can I ask that you please answer them um, in the actual Q&A section? Uh, also interested in them, really touching a little bit on, on the responsibilities and impact politicians can have and talking about some of the taxation mechanisms that we can use. I think everybody would be interested to know them, but I have to... Um, bring ourselves to closure now because we have gone over our time by seven minutes already and I, yeah, I need to close. So, um, Prof, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate uh, your time. Really, really appreciate uh, all the work that you do. I think it's highly commendable and we are very, very excited to have people like yourself. Um, like I said, we, you, we're in good company and with people like you, we have thought leaders that really can uh, move us in a progressive way and put us um, in, a, in a, you know, perhaps a, a better future, hopefully. So, Thank you very much. It's not just for me. There's a lot of comments in the chat box. Please have a look at them. Fantastic. Thank you, Prof. Very interesting, informative, a timely conversation. I couldn't agree. COVID should have really woken us up and, and opened our eyes about what, what can be done. And um, some interest from universities outside of Pretoria for you. So there's a lot, I think, that can happen there. This has been, I think, a very successful webinar, if I might say. We've had a lot. And, and this is one of those that, that I think um, has gotten a lot of um, engagement as well. I just want to thank uh, not only yourself but also the people that helped me here i haven't done this all by myself we've got pippa uh nadia we've got uh, lynn we've got justin Hawes, who always accommodates us and hosts us and give us his free internet connection letabo our intern and uh, gavin also helps us technically so thank you very much to everybody who's been part of this and um, absolutely Ellen, of course, our, 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 our speaker from the South African Events Council, but also for partnering with us. That's quite important. And our other stakeholder, which is the Event Screening Council, Chairperson, and always pioneering and leading us and helping us chart these, um, you know, um, uh, uncertain times. So uh, thank you very much, to Greg. Thank you very much uh, to everyone at the EGF. And thank you very much to everyone who has joined and taken the hour to listen to us. And thank you, most importantly, to you, Professor. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you much. Guys. And thank good you. luck to everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Well done. Brilliant. <laughs>